Oh, and my hair experiment has ended. I usually am bald anyways. I have a pretty big receding hairline, but uh, with all my wife's hospital stuff and things, I missed my window. I can I get about two days of growth before I have to buzz it again. And when you miss the window, then you can't use the buzzer. You got to use the normal cutters first, then do the buzzer. Well, I'm too lazy for that. So I decided just to see how much it would grow out. And I did an okay job, but I decided it made me look too normal. <laughs> I think bald makes me look more unstable. <laughs> Which I embrace. I like that. All right. So I showed you at the be uh, at the very end of class uh, last time um, something that looks like this. Can I blow one of these up? Yeah, I think this will. All right. So you know the idea here is. I mean, so just focus on what's going on over here so it's like a text-based game that tries to mimic games uh, like uh well coming off the idea of like dungeons and dragons but kind of is the text-based version of things like world of warcraft or uh final fantasy 14 any of these mmos um you know where you know you're running around you're you're killing monsters you're gaining experience you're getting in groups with people and go and fight bosses whatever but before we had all these high-end graphics cards and things like that, we had this. <laughs> and even before we had the internet, you had this um, for uh, uh, what were called bulletin board systems. So in your town, there might have been uh, one of the early bulletin board systems was something called Prodigy, where maybe there was like 15 modems in your, your town. Somebody would have a Prodigy server set up. And so 15 people at a time could dial in to that phone number and you were connecting, that was your internet. That was your source of, of things. And you could talk to people on there, but you could also be on the same, you know, play a, 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 a mud, one of these guys. But um, so this goes way, way, way back. And what's interesting is you look at something like this and you might say, oh, well, you know, how fun could that be? Shockingly, once you get, once you kind of get used to playing it, your eyes kind of hit the right place on the screen. So like when you just entered a room, you know, you, you know, you hardly ever sit here and read the description after maybe the first time you've been in that room. But then it's, you know, it says, hey, here's where you can go from here. The obvious exits, you can go to the east, west, south, north, yada, yada, yada. So then you can type in commands, you know, maybe you can type in look and that reshows you what's right here, shows you anybody else who's in the room, whatever. You can type in east, west, south, north, and it'll just move to the next room in that direction. So we're going to start building up something along these lines, but we need to start with kind of our, our map, right? We have a, cl a collection of rooms, um, we'll call it our dungeon, right? It's a collection of rooms and we're going to put our player. So we want to start thinking about this in terms of objects. We're building objects for these. So we're going to have a player object. So we're going to put our player in the starting room and these rooms are connected to other rooms through exits. All right. They link you to these other rooms. So if we kind of draw a picture of what we want this guy to sort of look like. Should hide this. Ripping all the screens. All right, well, we're going to put our, oh, yeah, that's our player. Okay, so, so there's our, there's our, uh, there's our player. Now we're going to have uh, some rooms. And of course, rooms are pink. I didn't make the rules. And who did? <laughs> yeah, let's keep going like this. Yeah, maybe that's our dungeon. All right. So, 
and this might be the entrance room. Bring to the front. Man, super ninja skills. All right, so we have these objects. These are, this is a room. This is an instance of room. This is an instance of room, so on and so forth. Now, what do rooms hold? So I'm going to create another slide here. It's just going to talk about our objects. Call this guy Mud Objects. Where Mud is our multi-user dungeon. Okay, so if we think about this as kind of like a, a you know, a, we're casting for a play. All right, we're casting for a play. We need to decide, well, who all is involved in our this play, the scene we're about to create here. Um, and by the way, this is the mentality that's used in the Unity game engine, which we'll be looking at the second eight weeks of next semester. So we'll first eight weeks, we'll be looking at Java, still text-based, but a little bit more modern language. Then we're going to go into a game engine. You know, because remember, one of the things I teach is programming is programming. The language doesn't matter. So you're going to start seeing there's so much similarity between all these things that, you know, you just get that programming skill set and you can apply it to almost anything. That's why we keep shifting gears on stuff. All right. So we're going to think about this as the as the 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 actors in a play. All right. So in order to set the stage for this, the people who are on stage are rooms, a player, and we're going to have these things like little they're going to you know we're going to call them exits. You know. So and an exit obviously is yellow. So we can think of these as kind of being the, the dudes that glue rooms together, something like that. And we can, I mean, we can invent this differently, but effectively what we're doing here is we are building our map out of Legos, yet we're deciding what Legos do we need to invent, right? Because these guys are going to link together. This is real problem solving with programming. Whether somebody else thinks this problem ever needs to be solved or not, we've decided it's awesome to go around in dungeon and create things to kill and make it really gory. I mean, that's the, the goal. Um, all right. So, you know, we're going to say these little yellow guys are exits and they link two rooms together and so on and so forth. Okay. So really there's in our, in our current thing, we're just crying. We're trying to make something that allows the player to just walk around the map. Okay. So what I see here in our scene is three things. I see a player, I see rooms and I see exits. Okay, now we want to think about what each of those guys are. We have player, we have room, we have an exit. All right, what's a player? Well, a player maybe has a name. All right, we'll leave it at that for now. We When we start fighting stuff, maybe we, the player needs to have those hit points and armor class, things we've think, had before, but just to get... You know, just to get this dude in here and let him start wandering around the map, we just have to give him a name. That's enough, right? For our initial proof of concept. Okay, so we'll say a player has a name. Now, what about a room? Okay, so a room might have a description like we had in that picture. A room is going to have like this room right here has a single player in it. This room right here has no players in it. Now, maybe in our initial version of our map, we only allow one player in a room at a time. Eventually, as we evolve our game, we might want to go into a room where there's a collection of players and there's a collection of maybe monsters in there. Next semester, we're going to start talking about inheritance where you have baseline classes and then from there you can create subclasses. So maybe we would say that a room has a collection of inhabitants in it, or inhabitants can come in the form of players or monsters, right? And the difference is, is that a player inhabitant is controlled by a human being at a keyboard, where a monster inhabitant maybe kind of randomly moves around the map or something like that. And some are uh, aggressive, where they just attack anything that enters the room. Some are passive, where they only fight back if you fight them that kind of stuff, but ultimately they are all inhabitants or entities, however we want to think of them, all right? 
But right now we're just building our simple single level objects where we're not thinking about making a generic thing and then things that make it less and less generic. We're just inventing new types, right? So we want to invent a room type. So you mentioned maybe a room has a description. Okay. Oh, we're still over here, right? So we'll say a room has a description. All right, what else does a room have? Go ahead. Okay, well, what does it need to have coordinates? If I'm in this room right here, that's my dude. So I somehow got placed in this room. We'll do that manually. Do I need to know about this room? Or do I just need to know where I can go from here? Yeah. Now, to your point, we might be interested in keeping track of a room, kind of where it is in the three-dimensional world or something like that. It, that might not be a bad thing to keep track of, just in case, right? Um, but, um, you know, for our simple model here, you know, if this is a room, a room has a player in it. We already got that down. Now we have a description. We have a player. Uh, maybe a unique ID, possibly a unique ID. We'll have to uh, we'll have to think about that. Um, for right now, since we don't know, let's stick with it'll have a description. It'll have we're just going to say a single player. Since we're only allowing a room to either hold a player or not hold a player, just allow us to go in there and walk around and that kind of stuff. Okay, and then a collection of exits. And then for right now, we'll say up to four. North, south, east, west. Keep this as a little two-dimensional map. We wanted to have it uh, be three-dimensional. We can do up and down, you know, whatever. Um, but let's keep it simple. Just the cardinal directions, right? All right, so we're going to have a collection of exits, up to four um, exits max. But so if we go back to our example in here, so this would be an example of a room that has four exits. From the room that this guy is in, we can go in any of the four directions. If I bounce back here, let's see if we can just guy give a. Okay, we gotta see it. Oh, here's kind of like a um, an example, like when there's monsters in there, you know, a huge minotaur leans against the bookshelf, blah, blah, blah. Um, just give me my exits. Oh, well, whatever. We don't always have to have exits in all the directions. So if we're thinking, if we're looking at our demo map here, this guy has an exit to the east and the west. This guy has an exit to the west and the north. This guy has access to the north and the south. This guy has an exit to the south, so on and so forth. All right, kind of following this. All right, but from any room's perspective, the most number of exits they could possibly have is four, going in every one of the directions, but we don't actually have any rooms here with four exits. All right. What's an exit? Yeah, it's, a, it's a, okay. That's what it functions as, is a way to get to other rooms. So it's one of these guys right here. But what does that exit need to keep track of? Go ahead. Mm, does an exit need to know about players? Yeah. This guy needs to know about this dude and needs to know about this dude. Right? The rooms that are connecting them. The rooms know about the player, right? Okay. But the exit itself just is sitting there holding on to two rooms. He's the bridge between those rooms. And a player can take that bridge if uh, if they want, right? Um, which takes them to another room, but it's the it's the bridge, right? Okay. Now, we could write this such that this guy actually exists with two separate exits. Maybe this exit has a 
source and a destination. This exit has a source and a destination. So that way we can say that this exit goes to the west. This exit goes to the east. Does that make sense? So you, this would actually be two different exits linking these two rooms. One of them links this room to this room to the west. This one links this room to this room to the east. Make sense? Okay. So we can just decide that that's maybe how we want to... Uh, do this, Oops, this, okay, so an exit is going to have a source room, a destination room, and a direction. Make sense? Okay. So at the high level, we've just invented the idea of three objects. You know, we've we've written down that this is the three objects we need to create based on our initial feeling of our little map that we're going to build here. Okay. So, um, and maybe this entire thing. Color is my background. Yeah, we'll make it black. So maybe that's the actual map. And what does a map hold? Does it? So let's think about this. I said I've mentioned that this room is the starting room. Okay, but whenever we enter our map, the way I'm advertising this is we always enter this room. So from a map's perspective, doesn't a map only need to know about this room? And this room happens to know about this room and this room. And this room happens to know about this room and this room. And this room happens to know about this room and this room. But all I kept track of is where do you start? So a map needs to know about where the you know the room we start with so it's a single room and then it maybe knows about the player that we've added to the map you know you kind of take an instance of a player you drop him into the map and he gets tossed into this room like woo. now he's ready to start just exploring all right so maybe we keep it a little bit more uh compartmentalized here and we say i'm just going to go ahead and create an object that's going to contain my whole map that way, maybe main doesn't get too messy. <clears throat> Otherwise, in main, we'll have a zillion rooms and exits we're creating and stuff like that. Well, we're going to hide those details inside of our map object. So in main, we just have to say, you know, map M equals new map. Player P equals new player. Map, or, you know, M dot add by player. And that's all that's in there. And then it starts. Go ahead. Yeah, so we're going to build a class for player. We're going to build a class for room, a class for exit, and we're going to build a class for our map. Or maybe we call this guy our dungeon. Yeah, we'll call that our dungeon. Well, we start off by building the objects. That's like having a couple bunch of piles of Legos sitting around. Then we'll start putting those Legos together to build this this guy. But we just did is we built a picture of what we want to do. And then we said, okay, 
I need to invent this object. So I need to write the class, the blueprint for that. I need to invent this guy. I need to invent this guy. And then I need to invent the actual dungeon that holds all of this together just to keep things simple. Really, it's actually not keeping it any simpler. It's just making it cleaner. So that in main, I can just say, you know, map M equals new map or dungeon D equals new dungeon. Uh, and then it, I can start adding rooms to it, but maybe those rooms happen inside the constructor. So main looks nice and clean. It's like, oh, this thing just came out of nowhere until you peek inside of the, the constructor for your map object. And, you know, it's creating, what do we got? Uh, six, six rooms and, and uh, one, two, three, four, five, ten exits. <laughs> and then a player and it's gluing all, it says room one and room three are glued together by this exit. So we're going to have a lot of kind of manual stuff put in there. That at a later time, we could read in from a file or something, or maybe somebody could uh, write another program that lets you uh, design your maps, and then it out, then it exports that in maybe a, a file format like JSON, and then you read that in by our map. You just give it the name of the file, and it reads it in and boom, creates all the exits and the rooms and all that stuff. So that's the direction this could head. But right now, we're just going to build, we have the simple Lego kit. We didn't. We don't have the eight hundred dollar Hogwarts uh, Lego thing with all the specialized little pieces. We're gonna say, look, I got some rune Legos, I got some exit Legos, and I got a player Lego, and I'm gonna connect these guys up to build something that sort of looks like that. That's what we're gonna try to do here. Go ahead. Yes, hundred percent. Constructors are named the same as the class like a special rule let's say all right so let's go and start uh let's see dungeon needs a start room and needs a player to start with that all right so let's go and invent our objects and what i'm going to do is i'm going to still use the header file approach because i've kind of indicated uh, and i'm hopefully going to prove to you here that i think that's still a good organizational approach we're gonna build header files for all of these. And what you're gonna see real quick is our header files are basically gonna describe exactly what we have here. So we're gonna turn this into some code. Then we're gonna implement those things inside of the implementation files. All right. All right, so let me create a new project. What did I log in with? Was it my GitHub account? Or was it my Gmail account? It doesn't necessarily matter. I just want to be consistent where my projects are. Other one? Yeah, uh, that's our, that's a Java one. That's I already told you that's the direction we roll into. We started here and then we, we roll into the next one. So let me log in. We'll go with GitHub. Where are my projects? Well, that already has a mud in it too. There, I'll just dump that. That probably had amazing stuff in it too. All right, so we're going to do... We'll save this guy as CSC 200 fall 2022 mud. I guess we didn't have to delete the other one. <laughs> okay, but that's what we do. <laughs> it was probably like two classes of code because we're in a very similar time frame as we usually are. Right after Thanksgiving, this is our wind down. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to create some classes for these. So... I need to create a player class. So we're going to have a player.hpp. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and create the rest of my classes too. I'm going to need a room.hpp. I'm going to need an exit.hpp. And I'm going to need a dungeon.hpp. All right, so now 
let's go and implement our player. Our player is just going to keep track of a name. And what kind of variable do you think uh, the name should be? Yeah, the string. That's a name should be held inside of a string. All right. So we'll come in here. We're going to say class player. And for right now, we're going to just keep everything in this public sense since we haven't talked about the other things. We'll probably hit that next semester. That's fine. Um, so under this public thing, we're going to have a string uh, called name. And that's what's going to be in there. And then we're also going to have a constructor that takes in a string name as a parameter. All right, so that's what player is. Player is going to keep track of the field that is the name, and then it's going to have a constructor that we can pass a name to, and it will set that name equal to that. But this is the header file for our player object. Next guy is our room object, which is going to have a description. What kind of animal is description? Cat, dog, int, string. Probably a string. Okay, a player. What kind of animal is going to be a, a variable for our player? What kind of object? Player object. One of the objects. So this guy is going to hold, uh, as I'm inventing this Lego, after I've invented this Lego, this guy's going to hold one of these Legos. Make sense? All right. So he's going to hold a player object. So that was for room, right? So we're going to have class room. Public. So we're going to have a string description. Then we're going to have a player. I'm going to call this guy it's going to be a player pointer called the player. And what else does he have? He's going to have a collection of exits. Now, what kind of, you know, what if we need to have multiple things with, uh, um, uh, if we want to hold multiple of the same type inside of a single variable, what kind of animal is that? An array, a collection of stuff. So we're going to have an array of exits. So we're going to have an int. exit array up to size four, we'll call this guy the exits. I'm sorry, not int, this is a, how about I just do this the right way the first time? The exits, that's the syntax in this language, right? All right, so I'm gonna have a collection of exits called the exits that's gonna have up to four of these guys. Now, just thinking ahead a little bit here, we're also going to need to keep track of how many exits a room has because it can have a maximum of four, but I want to know how many we currently have in there. Because remember in uh, C++ arrays can't communicate how many elements there's actually in there. So we're going to say int number of exits. We'll just keep track of one additional piece of information there. All right, so that's our room for now. We'll get to an exit. Exit, well, actually, let me back up here for a second. Is this guy going to work as is right now? What doesn't he know about? Doesn't know about player or exit. So I need to include, and since it's one of my classes, I need to tell him about player HPP. And I need to tell him about exit.hpp. I need to make this class aware of the player type and the exit type because I'm creating variables of those types in here. Make sense? All right. So that's our room for right now. Now we need an exit. All right, so here's our class exit. 
And the next, it's going to have a source room. Well, what kind of animal is that? Room object? Okay. So we're going to have our public section here. So we're going to have a room pointer. Source room. We're going to have a room pointer, what I call it, destination. Destination room. And then I need to have the direction. And what kind of variable type is direction? String, north, south, east, west, something like that. So we'll have string. Direction. All right. And this exit class needs to know about rooms. Yep. Include room, HPP. And I'm putting it in double quotes here because we created that. It's in our... It's in our directory. Okay. Now, an exit. Have we done exit already? Uh, or room already? Notice that room relies on exits. And exits relies on rooms. So if we follow that as a room comes in, we're going to say, oh, I want to include everything from exit. And everything from exit says, give me everything from room. Everything from room says, give me everything from exit. Everything from exit says, give me everything from room. Okay, infinite loop, right? Because we got these guys reliant on each other. Um, this problem has been resolved in more modern languages like Java and C Sharp um, because they don't, in order to have access to room here, I wouldn't actually have to include it. It would find it in the local directory. The, the local package is what it's called in Java. Um, but we're not looking at Java, we're looking at C++, so this is gonna cause a problem, okay? For right now, I'm gonna let it have the problem, all right, just so we can kind of see it. Um, but are we following that there's gonna be this, <laughs> this infinite loop thing? All right. Uh, I, it should give an error. It should give an error, but it'll probably give a strange error. Um, oh, well, if we're lucky, it would say something like room is already defined or, or something like that, telling you that you're trying to, to redefine it. Uh, you know what? Let's actually fix it. Uh, let's fix it now. I think we follow the, the problem. Um, all right. So uh, let's see. Is it? I think that's the thing for <laughs> I think this will I think it's room underscore HPP. We'll patch this up when we get to our error later. If it's uh, got to be a little different than that. not it, this is like a special macro okay notice i don't even have the dot he uses this underscore thing So these are uh, uh, compiler directives that are built into the, the source file here. And effectively it's an if statement saying, if player HPP is not already defined, go ahead and include it. If exit HPP is not defined, go ahead and include it. That breaks then our infinite loop issue. Because if room 
relies on exits the very first time through and say, oh, I've never heard of exit. We'll go ahead and define it. And exit relies on room. And it says, oh, well, I don't know about room, so I'm going to go ahead and define it. But then this guy, we throw back to here when we're including room, room already knows about exit now. So this, it will not include it again. Already knows about that guy. And these work like if statements. And I'm guessing the syntax might be slightly off, but this is pretty close. Um, all right, so we have our room source destination room or source room destination room and our direction for exit. Is that all an exit is? It is. Okay, now we need dungeon. A dungeon is going to have a start room, which is going to be a single room. And then we're going to have a player, which is going to be a player, right? So we have class dungeon. And we'll go back in and put our constructors in a second. So I'll have public. And a dungeon is going to have a start room. So this will be a room pointer start room. And it's going to have a player pointer. We'll call this guy the player. All right. So we need to know about room and we need to know about player. I'll just go ahead and steal our... syntax from here. All right, so he needs to know about player. He needs to know about room. So if player is not already defined, go ahead and include it. If room's not already defined, go ahead and include it. Notice here inside of my player class, I didn't have to do any of that because I'm not utilizing any of my other classes. Right. I didn't need to include anything else, but I also didn't need to do any sort of special directive to say, look, if it's not already defined, go ahead and define it. I believe that there are some flags in very modern versions of the C++ compiler um, that will let you get away without doing this. I think it'll just find it for you, anything that's local. Um, so it kind of, uh, we've already seen some examples where in more recent versions of C++, they've added in some things that make it behave a little bit more like some of these more modern languages. Okay. But I like to show this as being a problem because Here's then we, can, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, that way we can appreciate what these more modern languages are doing for us. So this is kind of one of those things like, really? I have to I have to manually deal with this. This seems tedious for something. It is not a major thing, right? Like, look, if if I, I say include this, if you already know about it, don't try to do it again. Just you take care of that. Don't make me say this special crap to, to do it, but we're going to show it here anyways. But this would be one of those examples of in a lot of modern languages, they take things along these lines. Things like, look, this is a problem. But the solution to it is always, always, always the same solution. So let's go ahead and remove the extra syntax for it. And we'll just do it behind the scenes, syntactic sugar uh, style. No. That's it. It's still happening in our modern languages. Yeah, those, those potentials for infinite loops still exist because they need to know, these objects need to know about each other. It's just handling it for you. And if you learn that language initially for the first time and never saw the problem, you would never realize there is a problem. See what I'm saying? I assume it works. You know, modern day, you know, in modern day driver, you know, you're not, um, you know, you don't necessarily go so far back to remember when people had to get outside their car in the middle of the winter and crank, crank the engine to turn it on, right? You know, maybe we can go back and say, ah, you know, I, you know, stick shift versus automatic transmission or, you know, maybe fuel injected uh, auto starters versus you, know, you used to have to pump the, the gas a couple times to get the the, 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 the thing flowing. Or if you, you drive a, a modern boat that doesn't have fuel injection, you go back there with a little bubble that pumps some fuel into the thing. So when you start turning the key, it has something to ignite, right? 
That's what fuel injection does, right? It squeezes the bubble for you. That's, <laughs> that's what's ultimately happening behind the scenes, right? But until you've had a boat where you had to do that, you're like, oh, I got to go all the way to the back and lean over and oh, I'm not all that flexible and all this other stuff. You kind of appreciate the fuel injection. I get into my boat and I just turn the key and it comes on and then you, 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 you just go. No extra crap. Um, but if that's all I ever knew, I wouldn't have realized that used to be a headache. Why people who like sailing stay as sailors um, because they think that power boats have too little stuff they have to do. Sailing is hard. At least they have these modern boats. They have like buttons you can push to, you know, do the rope pulling stuff. But uh, I have a buddy who's older than he should be to do that. Well, older than I would have guessed. You can be to still do that, and uh, he's all he can do a pretty big size sailboat himself, just diving all over the place. But he's terrible at golf. <laughs> really surprising how he can handle something that complicated and can't hit a ball that's not moving. Retired from here too. He's the one who uh, ended up building the pharmacy school. Uh, Doctor John Dellinger is his name. All right, so there's player. There's room. A room. Needs to know about players only if it's not already defined. Needs to know about exits only if they're not already defined. Um, a room is going to have a description. It's going to know about a player that potentially is in that room. Or we'll probably set this to null initially when there's no player in the room. It needs to know about, you know, the exits that this room has. I would assume all of our rooms will have at least one exit in them. You had to get to that room somehow. But you never know. You could have a teleportation room where you're stuck. Right, you yeah. know, not for the not for uh, the, the we're using the special array syntax that doesn't require us to use malloc. Um, I think we'll be okay here since our scope will be global to this object. Uh, and then number of uh, exits, so we can keep track of out of the four maximum exits, how many are we actually using? Okay, exit. If we don't already know that room, include it. Otherwise, we're going to remember, where does this exit? What's the source room we're starting at as we take this exit? And where are we going? It's our destination. And what's the direction we've associated with that? All right. Dungeon needs to know about a player, needs to know about room, but only if they're not already defined, um, which I don't think it would have been in this. So I think that in this particular case, um, you didn't need the if not defines. So if you wanted to situationally decide if this is a problem, neither room or player rely on dungeon. So we would not have an infinite loop in that case. So with dungeon, you could just include player and include room and it wouldn't loop back on it. Um, probably most programmers would just do that, but I don't know if you just never want to be wrong. You can always just wrap everything in an if not to find. Um, and then just like, look, just deal, <laughs> deal with it. Um, okay. Yeah, you probably could also take a shortcut by just having a, like a catch all header file um, that you put all this stuff in. And in that header file, all you do is have an if not to find for all your classes. And they just include that everywhere. Bad programming practice, but you could it, it would it would let you pull this off. Well, because first of all, then like for instance, dungeon doesn't need to know about exits, but you'd let him know about exits anyways. <laughs> if if you on every single one of your files here, you just included your catch-all header file that included all your other classes. Then you're giving you're you're making available to Dungeon the exit class, even though he doesn't use it. He indirectly uses it through rooms, but the Dungeon class itself doesn't need to know about exits. So because you're bringing that in, the size of your executable after it compiles and and links and builds you an executable program will be larger. You're bringing more libraries in to more of your uh, more of your classes. I don't think you'd have compatibility problems unless you start getting into the world where you have two classes with the same name. Uh, and that's why we have namespaces. Namespaces help you differentiate that. But this, 
these things start coming down to more of like organizational structures. Even this is an organizational structure thing. This is just like, look, I need to have access to these libraries and they can't be reliant on each other without there being a problem. So here's our workaround. Go ahead. Um, you mean my collection of exits? Why do I have an int here and this? No, because this is not a collection of ints. This is a collection of exit objects. Yeah, this is an array, right? It's an array called the exits. It could hold four things. What kind of things does it hold? It holds exits. I actually think, as I say that, they are exit pointers. It holds exit pointers. So I think that's the syntax. But yeah, we're not storing integers. We're storing exits. And then this guy tells us how many exits do we actually have on our array of exits up here. I bought this, this box capable of holding four individual exits, but I might only put two of them in there. So I don't want to look at bucket three and four of that dude if only bucket one and two are Bucket zero and one only have stuff in it and bucket two and three are empty, but I don't want to go and mess with them. So that integer tells me like, look, it's it's got four buckets, but I've only used the first couple. So I'll only mess around with the first couple. Another question somewhere? Go ahead. That would be this dude. So if I'm in this room right now, his variable, the player, would hold a pointer to this object. Whereas this room's the player would be equal to null because there isn't a player in that room. But as soon as this player traveled through this exit to get into this room, this guy's the player would turn to null. This guy's the player would point to this dude as he entered the room. So every room is capable of keeping track of a single player but at any point in time, by our current design, only one room in our dungeon has a player in it. Which then actually can create, like, if we're just thinking ahead of where we might introduce bugs, as we take an exit and go from here to here, we need to remember to actually remove our player from this room. Uh, and when we put him to this room, otherwise you might create a situation where you have pointers to players all over your map. Okay, this guy starts cloning them. So well, he's not really cloning himself. But they all still point to just him. Uh, but then you would have bugs in your program because you would have your, you would say, which direction do you want to go from here? And you say, okay, well, I want to go to the north. Well, there is an exit to the north from this room, but there's not an exit to the north from this room. And this player is still back here as well. So now he's in two places at once, yada, yada, yada. So, you know, we can just start using our pictures here. We can start saying, look, he left this room. He went into this room. I no longer see Green Star over here. I had to take him out of that room. And taking him out of that room means setting the player object equal to null for that room. Go ahead. Yeah, if you wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, we had, um, I think, uh, in high school, I want to say, um, I wrote a mud and um, I, I had a, a, a traveling wood chipper. So I had a room that actually traveled around the map. And the um, uh, so sometimes you would you might be in this room right here and you go to the north expecting to arrive in this room. But the wood chipper room actually would take its place that had different exits. And then it might put you um, in a different part of the map, but it would put pieces of you in different parts of the map yeah and then um but uh the, wherever your head was you could still travel magically obviously right you had to go back and recollect your body parts to reassemble yourself but now they've been thrown around the map yeah. oh yeah definitely yeah. Well, the better question is to ask is why is this high school kid putting a roaming wood chipper in his map that dismembers the player? And there's documentaries about stuff like that. <laughs> that's that's how it starts. Oh man. 
Exactly. That was before smartphones. So I, I had nothing better to do. <laughs> before that, I think I, I remember, actually, it was after that. I, I wrote a, uh, another MUD for the TI-82 graphics calculator. Um, and that one was called uh, Ghettos and Gangsters, I think. <laughs> it was kind of a grand theft auto, but focused more on drug dealing, I think. <laughs> Yeah, another documentary for that. Those <laughs> ideas. Yeah, this is. Yeah, these are these are red flag situations. Yeah, this is what I'm getting at. Um, okay, other questions before we start implementing these dudes. Okay, so let's start filling these guys out. So we're going to go ahead and create a player CPP. The player CPP is going to include player HPP. Now, player HPP already has a name, but I need to go ahead and implement my constructor. Can I not move that guy over? Dun, 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 dun. Nope. All right. So player CPP. We're going to implement our constructor here and we're going to set this instance of players name equal to the name that was passed in. And that's all a player does right now. He, well, we haven't even created an instance of him, but at this point in time, a player just knows his name. Very, very, there's lack of talent going on here. Okay, this is the guy coding stuff with wood chippers in it. It's a, it's an issue. I mean, it's, 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 it's a cry for help is <laughs> what we're dealing with here. All right, so for room, uh, maybe, what did I do? Uh, this guy. No, 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 no. This is just the constructor. So this guy acts like a normal method. The semicolon you're thinking about is when I define the class, you have to have this extra semicolon at the end. That disappears in Java and C++ or Java and C Sharp. Because you're just like, look, why are you making me put the semicolon there just randomly? It's, it's a thing. Correct. Uh, all right, so uh, then we'll do our room CPP. All right, and we will include room HPP. And we'll build our constructor for this guy. Oh, I didn't even rate my constructor in here. So for this guy, we're going to have our constructor room. When we build a room, what do we want to build a room with? Maybe it's description. Okay. So this guy will take in a string description. And we'll go ahead and initialize this guy. So we'll set this description equal to description. All right. But now we also need to go ahead and make sure we initialize the rest of our objects. When a room is first born, when it first comes into existence, it will not have a player in it, right? We'll eventually place a player into the room, but initially it doesn't have a player in the room. All right. So we're going to set the default value of the player to null. Uh, do we remember where null came from? I know we can set it to zero. Is that standard lib? You know what, for right now, we're just gonna say this dot, the player, that's really the better way of putting it. No, let's just leave it like that. We'll listen to the scream in a few minutes. Um, we probably need to include something up here to make null work but null is just a placeholder for zero. Um, well, let's just go ahead and remind ourselves about null. 
So we'll listen for the scream in a little bit. All right. So that's initializing player. My exits currently have nothing in them. And that guy's already initialized to just a, a four bucket array of exit pointers that actually currently has zero exit pointers in it. So I'm going to go ahead and set number of exits equal to zero. All right, now I can just say number of exits equal to zero like that, and that's fine because all variables resolve to their most local definition. But I mentioned last time, I like using the this keyword, if nothing else helps with uh, spelling stuff. So I'm saying set this dude's number of exits equal to zero. My, uh, uh, this room, while it's capable of holding up to four exits in its current state, as that room was just being born, it currently has zero exits in it. And I'm going to keep track of that here with number of exits. And I'm just going to specify this is the variable owned by this instance of the object equal to zero, even though it would have naturally found this guy because that is the most local definition of number of exits from the perspective of here. It's going to look around on the floor first, doesn't find number of exits, it's going to look in the parameter list, doesn't find number of exits. Then it'll finally bounce back up and get to the fields that belong to uh, uh, room and find it. All right. And then, okay, that's it for room. So when a room is first born, this is what the constructor does. Sets those things up. I have not given it the ability to add an exit yet, right? <laughs> or uh, really, or add a player. I haven't given, it can't do anything except, except exist right now. Okay, so this room just came off the, uh, the shop floor. It's sitting over here in the corner. <laughs> this is its current state. All right, exit. So we'll go ahead and create an exit H or exit CPP. And this guy will include. Yeah. Uh, in practice, actually nothing. Just naming conventions, header files for C++ are HPP files. And uh, source code files for C++ are .cpp files. Source code for Java programs are .java files. Um, uh, for C Sharp, it's .cs files. So just more of it. It's a naming convention. All right. So include exit HPP. All right. So now for our class, we need to go ahead and tell it you're gonna we're gonna have a constructor and constructor is going to take in an exit and maybe this guy takes in the direction when we first build an exit we're building the exit to the west something like that okay so this guy will take in a string direction now i'll go ahead and i'll implement that over here we'll set this Direction equal to direction. All right. Now we also, you know, let, let's go back and think about this for a second. Maybe we do the direction as well as the rooms. Maybe we set all of them up in there. When we build an exit, when I come back with a keynote, when I'm building this exit, I'm letting it know that this is to the west and it involves this room leading to this room. I can give it all three pieces of information. What does that require me to do? It, make, it requires me to make sure I've defined all of my individual rooms first. So I have access to those rooms. But then when I construct an exit, I can say, this is the direction. This is the room you're coming from. This is the room you're going to. I can give it all three pieces of information as part of the constructor. So I can actually say room pointer source room, room pointer, destination room. I'll have it just take a couple of extra pieces of stuff. Set the direction equal to direction. 
We'll set the source room equal to the source room. We'll set the destination room equal to the destination room. That makes sense. All right, finally dungeon. We're gonna create our dungeon CPP. And this guy will include dungeon.hpp. My constructor for dungeon, when a dungeon uh, first comes into existence, um, because of the way I'm anticipating us creating a dungeon, I'm going to say dungeon D equals new dungeon, passing it nothing, and then inside the constructor for dungeon is where I'm going to do everything else. Okay. I could say, take the player in as a parameter and go ahead and put the player in the starting room for that dungeon. Maybe we'll do that. So we'll say dungeon. And this guy takes in a player pointer the player so we'll take in this dot the player is equal to the player all right but then from here we need to create our actual map that's where all the detail stuff's going to happen, where we're creating all these rooms, that kind of stuff. All right. With the final idea that out here in Maine, we can include player.hpp, and we can include dungeon.hpp, And then inside of main here, we can go ahead and say player pointer Mike is equal to new player. And we'll give him the name Mike. Actually, we'll call we'll call him the player out here too. So my variable is called the player, and he is a player with name Mike. And we see that player's constructor takes in the name. All right, and then secondarily, dungeon pointer the dungeon equal new dungeon, and a dungeon takes in just the player. We just wrote that, right? When a dungeon is born, it requires the player that we're putting into that dungeon, and then inside here, he'll do all the magic of, of creating all the rooms, deciding which room is the starting room, creating all the exits, joining all the rooms together, all sorts of stuff like that. And we'll, so we'll pass this guy, the player. Okay. So that's what main will look like. In main, we create an instance of player and we create an instance of our, of our dungeon. Inside of dungeon, we'll start creating our rooms and stuff. So for example, maybe this is, uh, we'll just, we'll, we'll count from uh, um, bottom up maybe. So this is room zero, room one, room two, room three, room four, room five, something like that. So I wanna start creating my rooms here. So I'm gonna say room pointer, Call this guy room zero is equal to new room and we'll keep our descriptions extremely detailed so it's just, its description is called room zero that's how rooms are born the constructor for room just takes in a description so inside of our dungeon we'll build room zero and give it the description we'll build another room room one and he's going to be a new room room one and we'll build another room, room two. So on and so forth. 
Would there be a way to automate it so you don't have to have six lines? If you're reading from in from like a text file, okay. then you could do it. But right now we're gonna just a little hard code of stuff. All right, so this is our starting point. So create the rest of the map there. Let me save this. And now let's see what he screams about. I'm thinking definitely null. Well, no. So this is the infinite loop dealy. So that's the error you get. All right. So the if not defined thing must not have been. Give me, give me moment. Is this a C++ project? It was. Oh, that's the way I pulled it off in here. I can just define the classes on top. Kind of a hack. It does look cleaner though, but yeah, it's, it's kind of stupid. I'm just gonna do that. My explanation is already an accurate explanation there. So we're gonna say class player, class exit, like that. This is kind of like prototyping our methods. Those classes get created eventually. We know they're going to get created. We're just making him aware of it here, uh, that those words are legal words. Last room. Last player. Go there. I O stream is where string lives. Yeah, yeah, I didn't have to include them. Just, just prototype them. Um, all right, so let me just give you what your homework assignment is going to be, and it's going to be in terms of this. I'll get it cleaned up so there's no errors before I give you the link. Um, but your homework assignment finish the dungeon constructor such that it creates all of the rooms and exits and places the player inside the starting room. All the rooms and exits. I'm going to say, make sure you actually link the rooms using the exits. It should happen naturally anyways. All right, submit. Dungeon Constructor. Main's done. All right. You're finishing the Dungeon Constructor. That's where all that crap's going to exist. I already put three rooms in there, right? I started you off. So inside your, so you're going to create some more rooms here. Then you're going to create some exits in terms of those rooms. You'll make sure you pick the right room. That's the starting room. And you'll throw the player into that room. All right. Submit self-assessment and link to the code. I'm going to give you my code as a starting point, but I'll make sure I clean up the last couple of errors just so you have a solid starting point. Um, questions, comments, concerns, bribes. All right, I'll see everybody on Tuesday. Are you still doing? Are you still doing these two assignments?